الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, this evening we have a short program, introductory program to our sessions in Tafsir. Um, and as you're all familiar with, the role of the Quran and its source of guidance and healing, source of mercy for mankind, and to capture that guidance, that healing, that mercy, our scholars, uh, beginning of course with the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his great companions, the Tabi'een, have exerted um, tremendous effort in trying to capture some of the meanings of the Quran so that we would better engage with it and benefit from uh, the guidance therein. And so tonight we're going to talk about one of those great scholars and leaders who actually is from Jerusalem. And I thought this would be important considering uh, everything that's going on in the world, especially in that region, quite some time, to draw on some of the legacy of that region in hopes to not only uh, get into the tafsir by this great imam and delve into the Quran, but also to fall in love with that region and its legacy. Uh, so we're looking at one of the great imams of the past, a historian, faqih. He was a qadi, a judge. His title was Mujiruddin, which means defender of the faith. Abdurrahman ibn Muhammad ibn Abdurrahman ibn Yusuf al-Ulaymi. Al-Umari, this is an attribute to Umar ibn Khattab, he is a descendant of the great companion Al-Maqdisi, Al-Hanbali, also from the Hanbali school, of course. Uh, Imam Al-Ulaymi, he was born on a Sunday, this is the 13th of al Qa'dah, uh, year 860. So, not terribly old, not from the very early scholars of Tafsir, but certainly um, some time ago when he was born in Al-Quds al-Sharif, which is, of course, Jerusalem. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about his life, uh, his quest to seek knowledge. Uh, we're going to look at some of his works. I'll mention some of his teachers and what they taught him, and then we'll talk about some of the books that he authored and, and what what they tackle and their position within Islamic scholarship. So, uh, like many of our great scholars of the past, uh, the great Imam al-Ulaymi, his religious studies, they began with his father, who was a major scholar, and he was also a qadi, he was a judge. His title was Shamsuddin, his name of course, Muhammad ibn Abdurrahman. He studied fiqh and numerous, numerous other sciences with his father, uh, who is noted, by the way, to be the first Hanbali scholar of his family, a family of Shafi'i scholars. Uh, so he uh, was introduced to that particular madhab and then uh, uh, became quite knowledgeable uh, of it, passing that on to his son. His father was described as being a man of sound creed, of sound doctrine. He was a staunch defender of Ahl Sunnah. Uh, he did not delve into speculative theology, which is kalam, and he was stern against innovators. Uh, that was part of his father's uh, role in shaping uh, our imam and author, al ulaymi He was noted to be a gifted student very early on. At the age of six, he memorized a book by Al-Hariri called Milhat al Arab. Uh, he recited it to one of the great scholars, Shaykh al-Islam Taqiyuddin Abdullah ibn Muhammad al-Shafi'i, died in 867. You note here the title Shaykh al-Islam. That's because there are many scholars that bear that same title, Shaykh al-Islam. Essentially means that they mastered all of the sciences of Islam and um, were excelled to a level of being a leader. He was awarded an ijazah by his sheikh in this text, along with other works of hadith and various different narrations. By the age of 10, he memorized the Quran under the tutelage of his sheikh, Alauddin Ali ibn Abdullah al-Hanafi al-Ghazi, passed away 890. 
He attended the Hadith sessions of his Sheikh Muhammad ibn Musa ibn Imran al Ghazi. He passed away in 873. He was eventually awarded an ijazah by his Sheikh there. He memorized both Al Muqni and Al Khiraqi. These are uh, major works in the Hanbali school. He read them to the scholars of his region, and this included Sheikh al Islam, Kamal, Nabi Yusuf, al Shafi'i. He's one of the major scholars, passed away in 900. Also, uh, Abu al-Asbaq Ahmad ibn Abd al-Rahman al-Ramli passed away in 877 and Najm ibn Jama'ah as well. In 880 he traveled in pursuit of knowledge. He went to Cairo. He stayed there for 10 years benefiting from the scholars of that region. He studied fiqh with Shaykh al-Islam al-Qadi Badruddin Muhammad ibn Muhammad al-Sa'di al-Hanbali who passed away in 902. Uh, Shaykh Badruddin uh, this great scholar learned hadith from the likes of Hafid ibn Rajid, uh, excuse me, Hafid ibn Hajar al Askalani. Uh, and he took a liking to our scholar, our Imam al Ulaymi, imparted a great deal of knowledge to him while he was there uh, in Cairo. He studied hadith, several others, such as al Hafid, al Sakhawi, al Qutb al Khaydari, and al Jalal al Bakri. Uh, later on, he was appointed to be a judge. Himself, he served as a Qadi of Quds, Ramla, Al Khalil, which is known as Hebron today, and Nablus. He occupied that seat as a judge for 31 years, except he resigned from serving Nablus after two years. But he did stay in that seat of being a judge in Quds, Ramla, and Al Khalil. At some point, he traveled to Mecca. This was around 908 to perform Hajj. After performing Hajj, he stayed in Mecca for approximately one month in continuous recitation and worship. After serving as judge, he then occupied Mashal al-Aqsa as a teacher and mufti, and that's when he began to author books. So after his life as a Qadi, he started to teach, issue fatawa, and write. And we'll see some of his books and their monumental status, if you will. Some of them are extremely um, pivotal, I guess, in their topics. The first is Al-Uns Al-Jalil Fi Tariq Al-Quds Wal Khalil. This is like the glorious history of Quds, Jerusalem, and Al-Khalil, Hebron. Of course, it covers the history of those two areas in general, Jerusalem and Hebron. It's considered a monumental work on the topic, and it revived a great deal of interest and love for that region among its people. It was considered, and still is today, a masterpiece of its time. The most extensive historical work done on that particular region. It covered the prophets and their families that lived in that region or passed through or had something to do with it. it discussed its great scholars as well as some of the memorable events of that region, such as the destruction of the city of al Quds, which happened numerous times in its rebuilding. He also mentions the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who has a direct link to al Quds, of course, and discusses um, the companions that lived or visited to that region as well as the Muslims that conquered it and ruled it until it fell from their hands and then eventually he comes back to uh, the conquering or the reconquering of Salahuddin al Ayyubi and that's basically where I believe the book ends its historic account. So this book uh, is still discussed today. It's, it's available in print. Um, it's, it's probably, uh, depending on which one you get, it's, it's almost 800 pages in length. He wrote a summary of that book, al uns al Jalil. He wrote, wrote a summary, which, would be, which perhaps would be more accessible to many people. Another book was Al Minhaj Al Ahmad fi Tarajim Ashab al Imam Ahmad. This is a biographical work of Imam Ahmad's disciples, um, which uh, is quite lengthy as well. And because of that, it's very detailed, mentions the scholars, uh, who their teachers were, where they were born, their full name, uh, their, their works, some of their students. And because it was so lengthy, he then wrote a summary of that at Burr. Al-Munadid fi dhikri ashab al-Imam Ahmad and this of course um, yeah, made it more accessible to students of knowledge 
that needed a quick reference. They just needed the basic information about those scholars, and so they would use this as that quick reference. Another book he wrote was at Tariq al Mu'tabar fi Amba Man Ghabar, which basically means like the history, uh, like the, the real history of people that have passed. Uh, it addresses the history of the prophets and the great scholars from the beginning of time, and it goes all the way to the 10th century, which is basically like his time. He starts by covering Prophet Adam السلام, and goes all the way to Isa. Mentions some of the historical records of various peoples during those times other places. He talks about the Christian and Jewish communities. He talks about the areas of Hind, of Sindh, of Sudan, and other locations. And then, this is kind of like the first uh, volume that we're in, he relates the biography of the Prophet in a very summarized manner. And then he also recounts the biographies of the four uh, Khulafa, along with what happened during their time of leadership. He mentions the Khilafah of Bani Umayyah, which was after that Khulafa, uh, the Khulafa al Rashidun. Then, of course, this was beginning with Muawiyah and it concludes with Mirwan and Muhammad. Follows that with the Abbasid dynasty. He also mentions the Alawi Fatimiyyah, their leaders, what happened during their time, the significant events. He had mentions the Abbasid leaders in Egypt and also the Ayyubi Mamluks. And this goes up to year 901, which is basically all the way up until uh, his time. This was the first volume of a two-volume book. Second volume relates to the biographies of some of the companions of the Prophet He uh, recounts the biographies of the four great Imams, some of the great scholars, leaders, ministers, poets, and judges. He does this in a very summarized manner. And in the second volume, there are approximately 600 entries of names that he mentions, and they're all alphabetized uh, as one might expect. Another book that he wrote is called uh, Tasheeh al Khilaf al Mutlaq al Muqni, which is a work on fiqh, deals with um, the, uh, I guess, variant views in that particular text, al Muqni. Another book is al Ittihaf, uh, which is the summary of al Mardawi's al Insaf. Uh, and to understand the nature of this summary, you'd have to know what al Insaf represents uh, in the Hamdali. Madhab, it's one of the three uh, reference books. Al Insaf is considered a book on its, it's a unique book within the Madhab. Um, and Imam al Mardawi, having authored that, did an exquisite job to the point that the scholars said that no one ever authored a book of that caliber within the Madhab, what he did in that book. The next book, and this is where we're going to stop for a short period of time to discuss, is Fatha Rahmani fi Tafsir al Quran. And this is the book that we're going to be looking at uh, every day in Ramadan this year. Uh, so, to understand what we're going to be touching on throughout the month, to help frame our expectations, um, I just wanted to introduce this book uh, and to give you an idea of what it contains. So the Imam al ulaymi in the introduction of his work, he says that uh, it's a summarized tafsir. He's taking great effort to keep the language very succinct, it's very brief, while capturing the essence of what the great Imams have related in the past. So there are some major objectives or areas that he addresses, and then there are some kind of like supplementary, secondary, uh, topics that he is regular with. So, of the first are recitations. Uh, and, and he begins his tafsir with like a 10 section preface, an introductory uh, introduction to the book, what the objectives are, and then he brings this preface, 10 sections, they include various lessons in relation to the virtue of the Quran, the reward of servicing it via tafsir, speaking about uh, the Quran, etc. Uh, and then after that, he, he jumps right into it. Uh, the four major objectives of this tafsir uh, are, are mentioning the 10 well-known recitations. He basically addresses them, their guiding principles behind the recitations and mentions the meanings of those variations, what the variation would produce in meaning. And an example of this we can see uh, found in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 213. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَانَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً 
فبعث الله النبيين النبيين مبشرين ومنذرين وأنزل معهم الكتاب بالحق ليحكم بين الناس فيما اختلفوا فيه. So here, basically, in this verse, it, it means mankind was of one faith, or they were one community, ummah um, wahida, and this was before their deviation. Then Allah subhanahu wa taala sent the prophets as bringers of glad tidings and warners, and sent down with them the scripture in truth. This is where you have to pay attention to judge between the people concerning that in which they differ. So in this recitation here, it says, liyahkuma, which is the recitation of the majority. The word hakama here reads, yahkum. There's a fetha, you know, uh, here on the, on the ya and a dhamma on the kaf. And what this means is that the book judges he sent down a book which judges sent down a book in truth which judges between mankind in regards to what they differ so this is the majority of the reciters they they pronounce it in this manner the recitation of abu ja'far is read yuhkam bilhaq li yuhkama see the difference li yuhkum li yuhkam and here, uh, the ya reads with a dhamma, and the kaf with a fetha, which change the meaning that the book is used to judge by. It's used as a tool for judgment, not that the book itself judges. Um, so here's an example of what he will do throughout his tafsir, is to mention the various qira'at and what meanings are, are derived from that. He also mentions four types of halts or stops. It's called the waqf, uh, which occur in recitation. The first one he calls tam, which is like complete. This is a good place to stop and then begin after that stop because the meaning has been completed. So you complete the meaning, you stop, and then there's another meaning that begins after that recitation. The second one is al kafi. Uh, this is a good place to stop and then begin after that stop except that the initial topic continues after the stop so you're still dealing with the same issue the meaning is not lost though it, it's not an it's not an odd place to stop the next one number three is al Hassan he says this is a good place to stop but not a good place to begin after you stop because there is a connection with both the phrase and the meaning that Follows so a halt here um, would be because the reciter needs to catch his or her breath. That's why they would stop. It wouldn't be an. It wouldn't seem like a logical place to stop. But they stopped because they were out of breath, and so now they would pick up and they would continue. They may want to go back a little bit to capture that meaning. The last and fourth one is al-qabih, which is a bad place to stop, and this is because the meaning would be lost. This would be like stopping at Bismi and then going Allahi, Maliki, Yawmiddi, that type of stop is considered Qabih, it's the majority of scholars prohibit a halt or a pause in this case. The reciter stops here, they can if they run out of breath, but it's recommended that they go back a bit and they start again so that the meaning's not lost and it's not odd in the recitation. So those uh, four things or there's four halts or pauses he points out uh, as well so the first thing has to do with the recitations and some of the rules of recitation uh, the second major objective is uh, to address uh, any is to address any major uh, rulings legal rulings uh, he does this based on whether they're agreed upon or whether there uh, are differing views among the four schools. So when he says it's agreed upon, he means agreed upon by the madahib, the four madhabs. And then of course, if it's not a unanimous view, then he will mention the various different schools in a very general way 
using the reliant, relied upon opinion of those four schools. And he restricted himself to the four madhahib. He did not go beyond that to any other views that may be out there. And his father was a supporter of this methodology. He would venerate and glorify the four madhabs. Of course, addressing these topics, uh, these religious rulings, is not exhaustive in nature. He's not going to address every single one, uh, but he does address some of the major rulings and some that he felt were important to touch on, and this is done in a very summarized manner. He also mentions issues pertaining to usul al-din and doctrine. Does this one appropriate? So we're talking about the aqidah of Islam, and this is done also in a very summarized manner, and it reflects traditional orthodox conclusions. He doesn't get into all of the different uh, groups and sects, etc. Some examples of this uh, we can find in sort of uh, 42, num verse number 11, Laysa commit the shaykhun wa huwa samil basir. There's nothing like unto him. This is basically what the verse is saying. There's nothing like unto him, and he is a samir al-basir. Of course, a samir is hearing and al-basir is seeing. So what the Imam says in regards to the explanation, he says, what is meant by the word mitlihi, laysa kamitlihi, is his that, is the that of Allah. And the word shaykh, kamitlihi shaykh, which is a thing, refers to existing creation. Laysa kamitlihi shaykh. There is nothing like unto him. Ibn Abbas said, he has no equivalent, meaning Allah has no equivalent. And therefore, Tawheed is to affirm a that, which is different from all other the what. That is like himself, a being, if you will. Linguistically, the being. So Allah has a that, which is different from all other the what. He says, without negating it, there is no that like is that. No name like his name, no action like his action, no attribute like his attribute, except when it comes to the agreement of the word being the same word. He says, there's, there's the only similarity is Allah bilaf. The word, the phrase, and the phrase, not the meaning, not the essence the reality of those words. He says the divine that is too magnificent to have a created quality, just as it is impossible for the creation to possess a divine quality. If the heart were to imagine, the mind were to conjure, or the spirit were to incline toward an equivalent of Allah, it must assert that Allah is different than that. All of that is from the qualities of creation as they are subject to limitation and defining modality, which is kaif, which is an intrinsic part of the creation. The creator is considered too exalted for such descriptions. Another brief example of this is found in verse number 59 of Al-Furqan in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَامٍ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْأَرْشِ He is the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything in between in six days, then performed istiwa al al arsh. Istiwa, of course, has numerous meanings. This is istiwa according to its grandness without K for defined modality. And this is from the ambiguous, obscure verses for which Ahlul Sunnah oblige mankind to have faith in while relinquishing knowledge to Allah. Quotes Imam Malik. Imam Malik was asked about istiwa. He said, Istiwa is known. It's ma'lum. And Imam al ulaymi says, It's known linguistically. Its modality, however, is unknown, al kayf Having faith in it is obligatory, and asking about it is an innovation. Imam Ahmed was asked about the words of Allah in Taha, verse 50, Ar Rahmanu al al Arsh istawa. He said, it is just as delivered, but not as imagined. It is as it was revealed, but not what you might think it is. It's like, it's 
just take it as it is and don't delve into it. So that is just uh, two examples, very brief examples of uh, the manner in which he deals with these um, doctrinal issues in his tafsir. And this is uh, directly in line with um, the madhab of Imam Ahmed's uh, disciples when it comes to doctrine. The last thing, uh, he prevents various lessons and tender reminders. These are like raqaq, very tender reminders and thought. And this is done throughout the text when appropriate. So you'll find some soft, heartening lessons um, uh, that are often derived from, you know, uh, stories that we find in the Quran, etc. Number of secondary objectives. Uh, he also mentions the, lo the location of revelation, if it's from Mecca or Medina. He mentions the number of verses, number of words, and number of letters in each chapter. He addresses the reasons of revelation uh, when there's something specific for each verse. He relates the stories of the prophets, the past nations, as well as relevant people, places, and dates. I mean, he's a historian, okay? So he's already, you know, tapped into and has an appetite for that. He relates um, and defines a number of obscure words and technical terms that's known as like the Gharib al-Qur'an, which are words that, uh, I shouldn't say obscure, but not in use in everyday language. So even, uh, you know, uh, a native speaker would not be familiar with these words. So of course he defines those. Um, and then of course, after explaining and going into all of the detail that he does with each verse, he offers a very basic summary to basically conclude that verse. And he exerts all efforts to arrive at an accurate explanation based on the main sources of tafsir. Okay. He draws upon several previous works Tafsir al Tabari, of course, al Baghli, al Zamakhshari, al Razi, al Qurtubi, ibn Atiyah. These are just some of the major works that he uses uh, for his tafsir. For recitations, he draws on al Razi's uh, Lawamih, al Ibah, al Shatibiyya, and others. He quotes from the main body of hadith literature Musnad Imam Ahmad, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, Sunnah by Imam al Baghli, Fatih al Bari, and others. He references al Mughni of the Damn, Shaykh al-Islam's collection of Fatawa, al-Insaf, and other works of fiqh. Um, so basically, this particular book, Fatah al-Rahman fi Tafsir al-Quran, is one of, of the remaining books of tafsir, tafsir produced by the great Hanbali scholars. It was one of the books that was not lost. As we know, historically, that a number of, a significant number of works from our scholars were lost. Um, uh, throughout the ages and at some point just all at once. So there are other uh, books of tafsir if you're interested from the Hanabila. Um, one of the uh, one of the earliest ones is Zad al-Masir by Imam ibn Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala. It's available, uh, widely available in print. Tibyan fi i'rab al-Qur'an. This is by al-Ukbari. This is also a primary reference. It's about the Arab, the grammatical structure of the ayat. Tafsir al Rasani. This is uh, Ramuz al Kunuz. This is also a very famous, very large work of Tafsir. There's Tafsir of Na'ad al Nu'mani. And of course, there is uh, sections of Tafsir of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala. And one of the latter great scholars is Ibn Badran, uh, who actually began a Tafsir work but was unable to complete that. I think uh, he got to maybe uh, Fatiha and Surah al Baqarah, uh, maybe a little bit after that, and was unable to. Uh, do any more. Uh, Fatah al Rahman, this book, uh, is quoted in Kesh al Litham, Shah Hamdatul Ahkam, the Imam al Safarini, a number of times, and considered an intermediate work with tremendous benefit, according to Ibn Badran, um, who was one of the latter and final scholars of the Madhab, uh, who wrote a book called Al Madhal, which is basically the introduction to the Hanbali school. And he touched on various different books in fiqh and aqidah, tafsir, and usul, etc. And so he mentioned uh, the nature of this work in that as well. And then the last that I would say, he wrote a book called Al Wajiz, which is the summary of Fatah al Rahman. So he would write a work and then produce its summary so that it would be accessible to much more, many more people. He was celebrated by the scholars, acknowledged for his many accolades. Sakhawi said that he was the model justice of Quds, the ideal judge. 
He had a good disposition, he was well known for virtue, and he had an appetite for history. Al Ghazi said that he was the Imam, he was the master scholar, Alama, he was the bearer of transmission, Musnid. He had all of these narrations uh, that he possessed. He was a historian, a jurist, masterful in all of the sciences, adorned the pendant of understanding, both explicit and implicit. He was an orator, a jurist, a scholar of hadith, and an athari. Al Ulaymi was known for good penmanship, okay, which doesn't have much meaning to us today, but during that time, they were writing these books. They weren't typing these things out. There was no press to print them on. They were writing these by hand. And typically what would happen is they would write it, they would produce a copy, it would be available for others to copy. So there would be copiers who would be ready to be hired and produce copies for people. And he said, he used red ink in this book, Fatah Rahman, red ink for the verses and black ink for the explanations. You can see there's some artistry there uh, when it came to altering these types of works. And that was something that was done on occasion by some scholars that were really into penmanship. Passed away in Bayt al maqdis in the year 928, and he was buried at the base of the Mount of Olives just outside the walls of the old city. A little to the north uh, of a church which is called uh, uh, Simonu or Ni Simoni Gitsimoni, I think it's how it's pronounced. And this is right at the front of the tomb of Mary. This is where the Eastern Christians believe that that Maryam salam, was buried and his tomb is right next to that location. Um, if you're interested, you can look that up online. There's pictures of it. It's like a, a dome uh, that's placed over his grave uh, with four pillars. The architecture is obviously uh, of Islamic influence, um, uh, you know, among different types of architecture uh, with the various different faiths, etc. So that's where he's buried. Bet of he died in 928. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the Imam, of course, and to place all of his efforts in the scale of his good deeds. And we ask that he multiply his reward for every letter uh, that is read from this work and the benefit that is hopefully produced therefrom. And that's where we're wrapping it up. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.